The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God had been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. And I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. They will know you are my disciples, if you love one another. Sounds easy, right? Just... Be loving, and the world will know that you are of God. You're from God. But our first reading alludes to something a bit more complex. In the first century, the Hebrews lived what we might consider a restrictive existence. God had outlined in the Torah a fairly narrow path to being in good standing with God that uh, included where you were born, uh, what you ate, whether you were circumcised or not what festivals you celebrated, and and who you could marry, observing all the right faith markers and making the correct sacrifices. And to be honest, that's, that's a really hyphenated, shortened list. But there was purpose behind this restrictiveness. It wasn't just to be exclusive. The Hebrews had a mission to carry the promise of hope for their people, the Messiah, was coming, the promised and expected deliverer of the Jewish people. And so he comes. Mission accomplished, right? Maybe not like Rocky Balboa. Jesus was different than anyone had imagined. And instead of overthrowing their earthly, earthly rulers, Jesus offered a deeper, more expansive freedom. He reorients them toward the character of God, a, a God that loves them, not the rules. A God that is for people, not the rules. Because sometimes rules can't be applied lovingly to every situation. Jesus points out some problems with the Sabbath. The point of the Hebrew Sabbath is to have a day where you live in total freedom, freedom from work, from from cooking, from physical exhaustion, to really and truly rest. My friend Rhonda pointed out that the Jewish people eat uh, the Seder dinner reclining on the pillows because it reminds everyone that we are not enslaved. Human beings need rest, they need breaks and freedom. And they protected Sabbath with a rule that everyone must Sabbath. So the heart behind the Sabbath is so good. It's so really, really good. But Jesus' disciples are hungry on a Sabbath, and they they pick some grain, and people get mad. How can a rabbi and his disciples be, be working by gathering grain, be working on a Sabbath that breaks the rules? But it's also unloving to allow people to go hungry. Jesus healed on the Sabbath and people got mad. But it's unloving to leave someone you could help relieve of a lifelong disability when you could help them. Jesus changed the priority, realigned them with a God who is capable of loving beyond the boundaries of the rules. Remember, the heart of Sabbath was good, but when it harmed, Jesus reached beyond the rules to take care of the humanity of the person. Jesus would be the first people over program kind of guy. While Jesus centers on the Judean people, he does begin to share God's love with Gentiles. A Gentile is a a Jewish word for other, someone who, who wasn't born into the, their tribe. Uh, maybe they didn't eat what you ate. Maybe they weren't circumcised or they didn't practice their faith like you did. 
these weren't just people who didn't follow the rules. These were probably people who hadn't even heard of the rules. Well, hold up. Isn't this Hebrew Messiah supposed to be for the Hebrews, the promised and expected deliverer of the Jewish people? But Jesus pushes back and says God loves, God's love is for everybody, for, for all, not just for the Hebrews. That the Hebrew people are the vehicle for hope for the whole world. Now, to be clear, God loves the Jewish people. They were given a, a special mission. It wasn't easy, but they, but they did it. But inclusion into God's community was growing. It was widening, including more people groups than just the Hebrews. And this was a hard pill to swallow for some folks. They had just spent years upon years following the rules, doing what God had asked of them. And now anybody can join? People that hadn't, hadn't earned the right, why should they get their Messiah as well? For many Hebrews in the first century, this was a breaking point, that if Jesus, if this Messiah wasn't just for them, that it can't be their guy. And they bounced. They said, no thanks. Why should they change? Some accepted Jesus as Messiah, but asked the Gentiles to change, to become Jews first, to embrace, to embrace Jewish culture, custom, and restrictions, and then and then be included in God's kingdom. Get them into the get them into the right tribe and have them eat what they ate, get circumcised, and observe their holidays, and then they then they can join the team. Much of the New Testament, after the Gospels, is the authors trying to deconstruct these, these add-ons to the gospel, to the good news. I call them Jesus Plus. You can have Jesus. But first, you need to look like us, act like us, eat like us, live like us. The apostles struggled with this. Jesus, in his short time with them, had put them on a trajectory that included Gentiles in their good news. But sometimes, sometimes that's hard. Did Jesus really mean those people? He couldn't have possibly meant all people, right? The story we read at the top of the service is a record of this. Peter had struggled with his own sense of the rules. Gentiles, those people, ate animals that were considered unclean, things that a Jewish person would find disgusting. Gentile meat often came from sacrifices to Greek gods. People would bring their animals to Zeus or another god's temple, and it would be killed, and then the meat would be sold in the Roman equivalent of uh, like Marianos. So for a Jewish person, that was, that was irreligious. That was offensive to, to God. Shay and I were, were trying to figure out once how to host a family for dinner once. And uh, the mom and the dad were both Jewish rabbis who ate strictly kosher. And they couldn't eat on our dishes, eat food prepared in our pots and pans, and be sure our silverware or, or of our counters for an observant Jew eating with a Gentile or being hosted in a Gentile's home, it's kind of a nightmare situation. So here you have these Jewish disciples of Jesus being told that they have to overcome all of that to reach out to people who need God's love. And Peter is obviously squeamish about it. Maybe more than squeamish. He's, he's afraid. Maybe more than afraid. He's, he's proud of how well he follows his people's rules. And then he gets a vision, a sheet lowered down, filled with all the animals the Jews couldn't eat. And a voice tells Peter to eat something from what is offered. And Peter says, I've never even allowed something like this to cross my lips. And God says, don't call unclean what I have made clean. And this is repeated more than once. Just so Peter can put this into practice, he's immediately invited to go with a group of Gentiles and to eat with them, unkosher eating with unkosher people. Vision and all, I can just imagine Peter's sort of kind of, what am I doing here? Nervousness. But he gets over himself. He overcomes and he tells them about 
Jesus. He gives them the good news. And the Holy Spirit falls upon these Gentiles. And and Peter says more than that, it falls upon the Gentiles in the exact same way it had with the apostles at Pentecost. It was obvious to Peter and everyone else that God was showing up. And they baptized them right there and then. It was it was exciting. It was exciting also because God wasn't bound to one people group. God wasn't bound to even the rules everyone was certain God God was bound to. God was on the move. I'm a musician and uh, I love finding patterns, repeated rhythms in scripture that give away the uh, give away the composer's intent. God's story starts small in a garden, God walking with with just two. Then it gets off to a little bit of a rocky start, but God is with them. And then the community expands to a family. Okay, a super dysfunctional family, kind of a little bit murdery, but what family isn't a little bit weird, right? And then it expands to a tribe, and God gives them some more promises to guide their growth. And sometimes they they get it right. Sometimes they don't. But God is with them, even when they take wrong turns. And then from a whole group of people to a nation, a whole collection of tribes carry on and expand God's love to more and more and more people. And then comes Jesus. And he says God's promises and God's love are for the whole world to hear. That it isn't just about two people anymore. It isn't about your tribe or my tribe, my nation or another. It's about God's love expanding for the whole world. I hope you see the pattern. I hope you see the composer's intent. The church is meant to be a safe, diverse, inclusive place for all of God's children to belong. I'm sure you feel this, but culture is shifting rapidly under our feet, like like at hyperspeed. People are exploring more personal options and, and identities than ever before. And I fear the church has the potential to get left in the dust because we can be so slow to adapt, to embrace people different than us, to expand and change. In every era of history, someone has tried to tell some other group of people that they didn't qualify for the team, that God's love didn't apply to them. And in every era of history, eventually, eventually, the church catches up. Don't call unclean what God has made clean. Wouldn't it be amazing if the church became a safe place for every kind of person to be known, accepted, and loved, to to explore who they are under the umbrella of God's love in their life, fully accepted, fully loved, and included in the life of God's community. And perhaps more than that, they bless our community with new perspectives, creativity, and joy. May we be known by our love for one another. So here's my challenge as you enter the wilderness of maybe some new thinking. Maybe like Peter, God is calling you to reconsider a long-held view to expand your ability to love as God loves, to love, eat with, and welcome people that have been historically excluded. Maybe you're already there. We all do go to an ELCA church, after all. Maybe God is calling you to deeper work in this arena, to learn how to be someone who not just minds their own business, but offers deeper welcoming practices, like like understanding etiquette, practices like pronouns, or finding ways to be inclusive with artwork, what we share on social media, and who we invite places, and more. Here's the good news, St. Mark's. This is exciting work. God's love is always exciting work. 
And we have kids that feel more accepted in their youth group than in their schools. There are families that have joined our church because other churches have missed the heart of the gospel for others. And we can lean in and be the safe landing spot for those needing a truly welcome home. Let us be known as a spot in our community where God's love for the world is alive and growing and reaching out to those others in the world. I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The gospel of the Lord, praise to you, O Christ.